Uh, well, thanks a lot, John, for having me, and thanks all of you for uh, taking the time to, to hang out today. So um, I'm Darius. Uh, my last name is Contractor, but I'm actually a full-time employee. Um, I've recently joined Airtable and I'm leading the growth team there, um, which is really fun. Previously, I've done growth at Facebook Messenger, Dropbox, Bebo. So started out kind of in social, a little more Pinteresty, and I've more recently uh, been a little more um, on the B2B SaaS side, which is kind of an interesting transition. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about Psych, which is a kind of metric that I uh, that I invented to help me with some growth problems. So it sounds like everyone here works on growth in some capacity. Um, I want to ask: Has anyone had challenges either talking about growth experiments and why they're good, or finding growth experiments? Who's had challenges doing that? Okay, most people. Thanks for going along with me on that. So, um, I Psych is a way to help you with that challenge, a way to help you actually talk about growth experiments and actually find new ones. Um, we're gonna start with a fun example and then we'll go into some kind of theory of it and then we'll use that theory. Um, how many people here have know, know what Hooked is? Okay, that's more than I had expected. So Hooked is a kind of teen chat fiction app. It's, it's fiction in the form of like a chat conversation that you're watching. And so it's, um, it's something like, I don't know, very millennial or whatever after the millennial. Anyways, um, it's something very like, kind of youthful um, and the concept we're going to use as we go through this is the psych tank. So overall, I'll get into psych more later, but just think about right now that psych is your current level of excitement someone has about the, your experience. So like, if you're incredibly excited about something, you're like, oh my god, there's nothing more I want to do than this thing. Like, like going downstairs, like eight years old, you know, Christmas morning, like that level of excitement. It's just like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be doing anything else besides this. Whereas zero is like, you know, like filing my taxes when I like really want to go to bed. Like absolutely no interest in it, like just want to be doing something else, no psyched at all. Um, you're just like, I just want to get out of here. Um, so like those are kind of the two extremes to think about as you go through this flow. So um, just to ha have like an estimate of where you are right now, give me your psych level if zero is like head level and extended arm is like maximum. Like how psyched are you right now? Wow, okay, thank you, that's very generous. I see a lot of very psyched people in the room. I feel like I was an average like 40 or 50. So let's see how much more psyched I can get you in the next slide. So this is the first page you see when you open the Hooked app, um, at least a few months ago when we did this. Um, you're looking at a uh, chat conversation, although it's also like a stairway to evil or something, and like Tiffany is saying, do you hear that? Mom replies, hear what? There's a baby crying. Already it's getting interesting. Mom says, I'm not home. Wait until I get back. Tiffany says, it's coming from the basement. Don't go down there, Tiff. What, why not? There's something about your father I haven't told you. <laughs> but mom, there's a baby, I can hear it. What's more important than a baby crying, come on. I mean, if, even if the sight's down and a baby cries, honey, please ignore it until I get home. How am I supposed to do that? It's getting louder. Don't go down there. I'm warning you. OMG, mom, are you not grasping this situation? There's a random baby crying in the basement. It's not even a known baby. Uh, mom says, I know. So actually, it's apparently known to mom. Um, Just stay in your room. Hold on, I think it stopped. I don't hear anything. Good. I'm going downstairs to check. Oh my god, what the fuck? OK, how psyched are we to tap that image right now? Everyone is maxed out, completely psyched to tap that image. And of course, when you tap that image, you're first going to see what's in the basement. The, the, the problem of the random baby is going to be solved. And just to get there, you just need to pay nothing, seven days free. And after that, it's $4.99 a week. I don't know how many of you are on $4.99 a week subscriptions, but that's a lot of money each year. You're a growth team, so I'll let you do the math. Um, anyway, this is a really fun example of how you get someone more and more and more and more psyched you fill their psych tank to 100, 120, there's gas like falling on the floor of the gas station, there's so much psychedness in this tank. And then you kind of use it. You kind of like use that gas tank of energy to get them through a difficult flow, which in this case is converting to paid. Um, and for many of us, it's getting them more excited and then converting them to a user, an active user, a regular pinner, a paid account, an advertiser, all these things is kind of, we're getting people psyched and then having them do more complex actions. So this is a little taste of it. Um, where did Psych come from? So here's the problem, a problem that I was asking all of you about when we started. Um, the problem is that there's this challenge of talking about growth trade-offs is hard. Um, and the reason it's hard is we lack detailed language. At least that's my presupposition. 
We often discuss emotions and not specifics. Um, we say things like, I think this page will convert better because it's simpler. I'm like, I disagree. This page is too simple. I don't know what to do. And like, why are we splitting up the form? That just makes it longer. These are relatively high level conversations and it's kind of hard to really get down to the meat of it and have the detailed conversation you need to really iterate towards the right answer sometimes. And sometimes these conversations can devolve and get very more kind of personal, emotional, and it's like hard. It's like, okay, let's just try both. Let's do more variants. Um, but looking into that, I had a few insights after doing growth for a while. That first off, our emotions often end up being aggregated reactions. So like lots of individual reactions get summed up to emotions. I think it's simple. I think it's painful. And those reactions are often generated from each element on the page. So element, 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 this is painful. Um, and so what can be interesting is to actually not talk about the page, but talk about our reactions to each element on the page. Um, this ends up being much more actionable. You could say, hey, why do we need an email field? Otherwise, we'll never be able to contact them. Okay, that's great. Why do we need like the, pa the second password field? You're like, well, I don't know. Can't we just email them? Yeah, maybe we don't need the second password field. Getting more specific makes it a lot more actionable. And what I like to call these reactions, these emotional reactions for each element on the page is psych. Woo. Inside two, adding plus psych is valuable. So each reaction we have to the page is uh, like subtracts or adds emotional energy to the overall psych tank. So like as we see each of those form fields, our psych tank gets decreased. Or in that first example, when we see each of the texts between Tiffany and her mom, our psych tank gets increased more and more and more. And I think one interesting thing about growth is that um, actually adding to psych is just as valuable as making sure that we don't subtract too much psych for our like high cost actions. A lot of times people think of growth as just like making the button bigger or like reducing form fields and that's valuable and that reduces the minus psych of the complex actions. But actually adding to the plus psych, getting them more excited to do the complex actions later can be just as valuable. So that's the second, second insight of this framework. And that framework is also built on this idea of the psych tank because like all these things sum, uh, sum into the psych tank, the minus, plus, the minus psych and plus psych. And so given that you have this tank, you want to actually increase it as well as decrease it slowly. So you could think of this to get like really numeric and visual with it as like an actual curve of the user's psych tank, the user's kind of emotional energy, the user's like interest in your site. Starting out somewhere, say in this example, like 52, and then as different things happen to you, like you see this headline offer, you see the attractive design, you get more sites, and then as things kind of are costly or like less attractive to you, your site goes down. So in your email, in your credit card, and you can actually plot this. To be frank, at this level, I just want to do the disclaimer that this is getting numeric about something that's primarily emotional, and so there might be like an over numeracy to this presentation, but I think it's worthwhile to think of these as going up and down and at least having some percentage versus one versus the other. Like, is this thing twice as bad as that's good? I think is an interesting discussion. Okay, so now that you loosely know the psych framework, it's assigning like plus psych and minus psych and numeric values to different elements on the page, summing those up to see how your gas tank is doing as you go through a flow, let's apply it. And so we have Gru here to help us go through the examples. So what we need to do is follow the user attention slice, which we'll talk about in a second, give each element a plus or minus psych score, and then we can uh, debate and optimize endlessly and, and win. So let's start out with the match.com homepage, then I'll go to Airtable signup flow, and then we'll have time for questions. So match.com, this is a screenshot from a few years ago, um, so I'm kind of like dating myself in my presentation, but um, it's just kind of a fun one, and like maybe this is too 1996, but uh, you know, everyone has visceral reactions to dating sites, so it's fun. So this is the match.com homepage. So we can look at this for a second and say, hey, are there elements on this page that you think are plus psych, like add fuel to your gas tank, or minus psych, kind of like subtract out that fuel from your gas tank and make you less excited about continuing? Um, maybe pick out two elements plus and two negative. So the way we want to look at this page is kind of like slicing it from upper left to lower right. Um, I kind of call this like samurai slice across the page. And the reason I think that's interesting is that oftentimes that's how we kind of subconsciously scan pages. Our eyes kind of flit over them quickly to figure out like what are we doing here, what do we need to do next? Like in theory, um, 
people should like read everything on the page and then make the decision as to what to go next, go to next. But we all know we don't do that. For instance, can anyone tell me what it said in the upper right hand corner of that page? What did it say? Okay, how many people knew that it said to take a personality test? Okay, about like half or a third of you. So like we were staring at that page for like 30 you know, seconds and like we didn't even go there because who cares? It's like some weird promo in the corner or whatever. So I'm just highlighting that people don't see most of the stuff on the page, as many of you know as growth experts. Um, but I do the samurai slice across the page, maybe they see match.com and a few of these other things in order. So what makes it compelling? First, they, one thing they might see early is you know, attractive people on the page, that might be plus psych, um, number one site for dating. This is actually a different screenshot, but I had a cool gift, so I'm keeping the slide. Um, um, you know, defaulting to I am a woman seeking men, I think that's kind of an interesting default. Uh, a lot of their paid usage comes from men seeking women, but it's interesting that for a woman seeking a man, it defaults to the correct thing for them, and then for a man seeking a woman, it defaults something that like sounds attractive. They're like, hey, there's women seeking men on this site? Great. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> I am a man seeking a woman, so the contrapositive is exactly what I'm hoping is here. Um, and so, um, and also the age range is something that's kind of reasonable to start, 25 to 35. Those are the you know, ages of people at least five years ago who might be on the site now might be a different uh, set of people. Um, what makes it compelling? So I think as you come in, people say, oh, match.com. They have some like brand knowledge. This isn't some random site, this isn't like, yourbestmatch.com. They actually have a brand association that's positive. Um, there are cute signals. Um, probably most of those people are married and older by now because it's old. But uh, also it's kind of an unlockable experience. It's kind of fun to present like, hey, here's all this stuff. Just kidding, fill out this form on top first. Um, as I said, woman looking for a man, age range. Uh, postal code is like, is, is a little bit of work. You have to like, you know, whip out the old keyboard and type it in. But at least you're like, okay, this is a quick way to define who I'm looking for. Um, and it's got a big green view photos button. Who doesn't like photos and viewing them? So let's break that down. So I'm, I encourage you to all this, do this on your own for your own sites, but um, let's say that the person comes in with about 30 psych. Like, you have to think about how people come into your site. Are they coming on a referral? Are they kind of bouncing here randomly? If you're on match.com, it's pretty likely that you either typed it in or you searched for dating or you came in on some kind of ad. So you're probably like relatively high intent. You didn't like randomly get here. It's not like spam email sent you to match.com. Like you're here with probably some intent. And then you maybe see the cute signals, which is really exciting. So that's like plus 10. You're like a lot more psyched than even when you came in. But they're hidden, how to see more, that's kind of interesting. I give that a plus two. And then you see this like form field block and you're like, ugh, like I'm gonna have to fill out a form? Like I thought dating would be easy. Um, and so that's maybe minus 15 psych. You know, I thought I could just swipe. And you're like, wait two years. Um, and then it says, you know, Okay, maybe you're a woman, so like that's maybe plus two, like okay, this like meets me where I am. Or you're a man and you're like, oh great, women are on this site, awesome. And so maybe that's plus five. 25 to 35 is gonna fit most people, uh, plus five. Near me is good um, with you know, typing in the location, but you also have to like type it in and what have you. So maybe that's like minus five on the whole. Um, and then you're, you know, show me the photos, that's exciting. So that's a plus 10. So I kind of graph that out here, coming in at 30. Um, getting overall a plus psych of 12 and then ending at 42. So the hope is that someone kind of comes in and actually accelerates through this experience. They actually get more psyched as they go through it and they're like ready to like take on the next thing out in the next page. Just for fun, I said, what if it wasn't optimized? What if we actually did the like, you know, like paid someone on fiverr.com to build the site for us with like no assets and no defaults and no growth work, right? So all we have is match.com, a form and a submit button. And so you might come in at 30 and just have the negative psych from the previous examples and then end at 10. And you're like, okay, maybe I got through it, but like I'm really, meh. like I'm already disliking this. Like it's a lot of work and it doesn't, I'm not sure what I'm getting. Um, okay, so um, I kind of blazed through that, um, but that's just comparing these again, that you can actually get, um, you can go through the flow and actually end with like plus 12 psych or minus 10 psych, depending on how you're doing it or minus 20 psych, um, it makes a big difference. And this is especially important for match.com because the next page actually isn't viewing photos. Um, the next page is actually like a arduous, um, I think 12 page profile fill out experience from like the early days of uh, matchmaking where they were like, what's your eye color? Like what's your like, you know, list of favorite pets and like all these ridiculous things, you know, as if you're filling out some like SQL server survey or something. Um, 
and it's, it's really painful, and you need all this energy from this positive psych you got from this page to get through that experience. Um, and you actually don't see photos for like another 10 minutes. Um, um, but that's one reason you need all this. So that's how Match.com did it. Airtable, that's where I'm working now, and we'll go through that. So Airtable, as perhaps some of you know, having used it, it sounds like, how many people have used Airtable? Okay. Um, so it's a database that anyone can use. It's got views that look like a spreadsheet, a Kanban board, a calendar. You can kind of like make your own database powered app and do a number of different things with it. You can track growth experiments as I like to do with it. Um, you can make a list of like all your favorite, you know, you know, pets or, you know, Star Wars characters or whatever you want to do to like, you know, take, take care of something in your personal life or business life. Um, and it's a really powerful general case system that allows you to build kind of internal tools that you'd otherwise have to like bug a programmer or IT expert to do. Um, so this is the homepage. I'm not sure how well you can see this. Oh, you can see this, okay. Um, but it starts out, let's go through the site for this. It starts out with this pitch, create your way, which is, um, well, let's start at the beginning. So if you got to this page, you probably got here because someone told you that Airtable is awesome or you came in on some kind of marketing something or other. Um, there's a small chance you typed in Airbnb and you went to the wrong place, but overall you probably are like actually seeking like a database that you can use for, you know, that looks like a spreadsheet. So you're, you're probably excited to be here and you're ready to like try it out. One thing that's actually interesting about B2B SaaS sites in general compared to kind of social experiences like Facebook and Pinterest is I have found um, that the intent curve is much steeper. And what I mean by that is that when you're kind of perusing a social site or like an entertainment site like YouTube, if you make something a little easier, you capture a lot more users. Um, but I found working at Dropbox, the intent curve is much steeper. They either like want to do it and they're going to figure out a way to do it or they're not. And so if you make something a little bit easier, you actually don't capture that many more users. Um, and like examples are like uploading a file. There's no way to like growth hack someone into uploading and sharing a file as I learned the hard way. Um, because you either have something that you'd like someone else to see or you do not. <laughs> um, it's not like, you know, like, hey, do you want to see like, you know, Conan O'Brien's most hilarious video? You're like, ah, maybe I do actually. Um, but, uh, but that's not the case with, um, with, with these kind of sites. So with, with something like Airtable, you have higher intent users, but you need to take them to what they actually want to see. You need to help them do what they came here to do. Um, so starting off, I'm given a little higher psych, like 40, like they're trying to get a complex job done. They're probably being paid to come to Airtable. Like they're probably, it's a Monday afternoon and they're trying to actually get something done. Um, they say, they see the good designs, so that's like plus five psych. Um, they see this high level invitation to create, which is maybe a bit vague, and they're like, oh, I'm not sure I want to create, I want to get a job done. But we kind of need that mandate to give people like the high level um, abilities of Airtable. Like you can create anything here. And we need to get that in people's head, and we're willing to pay a slight cost to do that. And then we have this, like, as you scroll down the page, multiple views below the fold that like show you the, the spreadsheet view, the Gantt view, the, the, the um, calendar view, all these kinds of things. So coming out of it, we hope that people have like a plus 10 psych and end at 50, like ready to check out Airtable. Sign up form is kind of like standard issue. Um, it's a form to fill out. No one's excited about that. But it's clean design, good spacing, Google sign up. Sign up for free, which is important for business applications because a lot of people are like, oh, do I have to pay for this straight off? You know, do I have to talk to a salesperson? Nope, just sign up, it's free. Um, I think this does take a little psych out of the tank and ends you at a 39. Then we have a questionnaire, um, which actually appears sequentially so it's not quite as burdensome, but it is a few questions. Um, and so that's probably another like minus psych, but the questions do seem relevant. It's a, again, a good design. Um, it seems like things that might actually help you do your job at Airtable. So you're like, okay, that's a little more cost, but like, let's keep going with this. Then you set up your workspace. All these fields are optional. Um, one really interesting learning from, from Dropbox is that literally asking people to type in the name of their workspace can be a blocker. Um, uh, because we did interviews with people and they were like, I don't know what the name of my team is. I'm like, what team are you on? They're like, I'm on marketing. It's like, why don't you type in marketing? And they say, well, I'm not sure if it's supposed to be like, you know, Pinterest marketing, or I'm on like a sub team of marketing that actually does brand marketing. Like, I didn't know what to type in, so I left it blank, and then I couldn't go forward. And so we were like, okay, let's just like tell people that you can like type anything you want to the name field. And we actually made over a million dollars in net new revenue because we just told people that name was optional. So it's surprising like what little bumps in the road can be really hard for people. Anyways, as an aside. So people probably get through this, it's just one required field, uh, another negative four psych. Then they get to the dashboard. I just screenshot like the, the core part of it, but they're on the dashboard with all these options of workspaces and their core templates that, that are defaulted for them based on the questions they answered for the previous thing. And so I think this is probably like a plus 12 psych where people are like, whoa, here's the power of Airtable, like I made it. Um, we have actually, you know, 
We have the bug and issue tracker, product planning, product launch, project tracker, sales CRM, content calendar, all the things you might want being like a you know, technology professional, and people can start clicking in and getting onboarded through that. And so then I think their site starts to go back up, ending at maybe 35. And then we have, I think, possibly the most interesting part and the most challenging and exciting part of, of Airtable growth um, is the base onboarding. So we call each kind of application or database, we call it a base. And it's an individual place where you have multiple tables and you can add records and you can link the records and have different views. This is the powerful, magical part of Airtable. But it's so powerful and magical that it's a little hard to explain to someone. It's like setting up a database infrastructure, which most people haven't done. And it's a great UI for doing it, but the concepts behind it are a bit new to people. And so I think when people come in, they probably say, like, wow, this is powerful. This is like a super spreadsheet. And so that's probably a plus 10. And I think savvy users who kind of know what they want to do and understand some of these power are like, oh my gosh, I can build this thing myself. I can finally add the fields to the CRM that I've always wanted, and they can grow it and iterate it, and they get really excited. And I think low, lower context users who don't understand what's going on as much might say, whoa, like, what do I do next? Like, why is there this def default data in the templates? How do I get rid of it? How do I like, not mess this up, which a lot of users are worried about? And so I think this is a really place where um, it's this really interesting challenge where we need to like, onboard people into a general case product um, and actually help them figure out like, how does this work for you? Like, how do you make a general case database maximize your workflow? And so that's kind of a, this, this base onboarding tries to do it by explaining the different parts. Um, I didn't go into each of the sites for each of them, but I think it's kind of this bifurcating experience at this point. So I think the overall psych tank, psych tank for savvy users maybe ends at a 45, like they're really ready to power through and build their first database. And for low context users, maybe ends at 30. Like they still have some energy left, but um, a lot less energy because they're still trying to figure it out. Okay, I was gonna give some psych tips. Um, one of the ones that I like, um, and this is stolen from Evan Pagan, is give away your best stuff. So like if you have something really great on the side, you're like you have the best Pinterest board ever, like people love it, everyone loves this Pinterest board, give it away, put it in onboarding, like let people have your best stuff immediately. Twitter does this in onboarding, they like list the people that you're most likely to wanna follow, like Taylor Swift, the president, all these different things. Uh, give away your best stuff. Uh, show data as much as you can. Uh, see which friends are doing this, all this kind of, you know, like, you know, show data that you have, show like that you have all this stuff like hiding in the background. Don't just give people like high level pitches, but give people like the raw data of your site. This many people did this today, those kinds of things. Demonstrate quality is always good. Just like a high quality design, good spacing will convince people that this is like a worthwhile place to be. Fill up their site tank. Um, making a promise, photos on the next page, promises you can deliver on, hopefully without like 12 pages of like filling out profile bio data. Um, use trusted channels. If you come in with more psych, like from a referral or from some other place that people really believe that like this channel is high quality and so I'm gonna come in with more psych, I'll have more to go through the experience, that can change even existing flow coming in through a different channel. And ways to reduce psych, uh, be more automatic, guess location, desired product, what they need ahead of time. Um, try to ask as few questions or make the, have them make as few decisions as possible. Um, make the work fun. Like if you have to put in required fields, show them like the value of it, like type in your email to get a free newsletter, all these kinds of things. Um, move later, put the work after the excitement. So even if you have the same flow, moving the high psych bits to the front and the low psych bits to the back um, can be really powerful because then people get more and more psyched before they have to do the work rather than doing the work, possibly bouncing before they see the value. <laughs> Okay, those are some general kind of like growth tips even. These are some psych exploration methods that I use um, that, I, that I personally really like. Uh, the 10 foot test is simply rolling your chair 10 feet back from your computer screen and seeing if you can figure out what's going on. Um, most high, high traffic pages like onboarding, setup, payment, it should be pretty clear what's going on even if you can't read the text on the page. Um, and that's, that's clarity through like the layout of the page, like. Um, the, the number of buttons, whether buttons are dark or light or other things, should, should clearly communicate what's going on. Um, I also really like the cross out test, which is pretty much taking a page and maybe like printing it out and then just crossing stuff out until the page is nonsensical. Um, it's surprising how much you can cross out on most pages and for most sentences before it actually doesn't make sense. Um, I usually think that you can get a lot of sentences down to like about five words. Usually when people scan pages, I find that they read the first three to five words of each line. So if you can make those first three to five words something compelling enough, they're gonna read the rest of your words. That's really tremendously valuable. Uh, Minority Reports, another favorite of mine, is to 
super serve a non-primary user group. Um, one great example of this is someone using a flow who's a long-time user. Um, so for instance, many times we build flows for like the every user. Like, oh, someone coming in, they might have like zero boards, they might have this. Let's just make an experience where whatever they're coming in with, it works. That's great, but when you go back and look at that flow, you might find that you know, 40% of users are coming in with like 10 or more boards. Could we make an experience that super serves those users by using those boards as like the raw material to create whatever we're doing, like ads or otherwise? Um, so really super serving, like not all the users, but an important enough, like a large minority case as it were, um, such that we get a lot more people succeeding through the flow overall. Because um, we can double the conversion rate of 20% of the users, you know, the entire flow is like 10% better. Um, uh, table flip. I think that's kind of an interesting one. So that's when you take an experience and you think to yourself, okay, there's users who are gonna do what I want them to do, like send invites, sign up for the thing. And then there's users who are like, heck no, like I'm not gonna send any invites on your weird site. Or like, I never wanna do that. And thinking about who those users are and like what they're approaching this with, how to kind of like split them off as it were and say, hey, you don't wanna do this? Great, let's take you straight to like your type of experience. And so we have obvious things like with the skip button, et cetera, but I think it's interesting to split those users up early and give a really deep, powerful experience for the people who do wanna share, who do wanna take the action, and then just let the people who don't wanna take the action kinda go somewhere else. That was it. Um, feel free to tweet me um, at DariusMC, email me at Darius, be at Darius.com. Um, I do have a post on psych at Darius.com that you can read. It's got some of the information we went over today and some other points. And if you're interested in actually um, how I track growth experiments with Airtable, uh, we have a whole system that we do to, to do that. You can find it at bit.ly evelyn-airtable. Um, and I'd love to answer your questions. <laughs>